be sharing some some nice math mathematics and, uh, and 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 at least hear each other in these uh, strange times. And hopefully, we can make real meetings again uh, soon. So uh, my my topic today is about uh, Liouville type theorems and their applications. And uh, so I will talk about some a kind of sample of problems. Some four actually four. Oh, can I? I hope I can. Yeah, okay. Now uh, it seems to work. Um, I will talk about four different uh, problems. So maybe it's a little bit strange to to share a, a, a talk in four parts, but they have um, the four parts have a lot, lots of things in common. First, they are about Liouville type theorems. And um, also another interesting common point is that for all the four problems, uh, Laurent and Marie have made uh, fundamental contributions in each of these four problems. So I thought it was a good, uh, good way to say thank you to them by discussing some, some results on, on those uh, four problems. And maybe a, a third uh, common point is that the results that I'm going to discussed today have, um, are all uh, less than one year old. So they have all been produced in the past, um, past year, more, more or less. Uh, okay, so let me first start with the lane ending equation, which has been the topic of uh, already several talks uh, in this conference. And of course, it's a very, very classical uh, topic. So let me start with the um, most famous Non-linear Liouville theorem, which is the one by Gidas and Sprague, 1981, and it tells you that this uh, equation has no positive classical solution in the whole space if and only if p is subcritical in the Sobolev sense. So this, of course, well known to everybody here, and there is also a very nice, simpler proof by by Laurent and Marie uh, in their now classical paper of uh, 91. And um, now I would like to ask about, uh, to consider the half space case. So the reason for that is not purely um, aesthetic, it's also because it has, uh, when you combine the two cases, uh, whole space and half space, then um, Gidas and Sprague discovered that they are, they, they are fantastic applications. Uh, by the rescaling method, you can, derive a priori estimate uh, in the range where the bo both uh, results are, are, are valid. This is the subcritical range. And from uh, these a priori estimates, you can get existence for directly boundary values associated with uh, uh, equations which are asymptotically uh, equivalent to uh, the Lenin equation by, and this is done by degree theory. So the result is also due to Gilles and Sprague in another paper, same year. And it says that the same equation, but with uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions in the, in the half space uh, has no positive classical solution, provided P is uh, subcritical or even critical. And this already uh, some uh, slight difference, which will turn out to be um, much more, uh, much bigger than, than what it looks like. So these are two very classical results. And now uh, the, the motivation, our motivation is to ask about the, the, the um, whole space. In the whole space, as we saw, Sobolev uh, exponent is optimal. Now, in the, what about the whole space? Can we go further? So for bounded solutions, there have been some important improvements in the past. The first notable improvement was by Norman Denser. Uh, and he was able to prove that for bounded solutions uh, in the whole space, there are there is non-existence in the larger range n plus one over n minus two minus three, which is nothing but the uh, Sobolev exponent in n minus one dimension. And his proof was to, um, by moving planes, show monotonicity of the solution and end up with uh, a solution in the whole space, but in n minus one dimension by looking at the limits as x n, the normal variable goes to infinity. And uh, okay, um, 15 years later, Alberto Farina uh, was able to use similar arguments combined with uh, the, at the time, new um, studies on, on stability, on stable solutions. 
So he was able to enlarge the non-existence range for bounded solutions to the Joseph Lundgren exponent in A minus one dimension, which is this uh, uh, complicated uh, expression, but which is familiar to many people here. Uh, so in particular, up to 11 dimension, there are no bounded uh, solutions. And then much more recently, there was a very nice paper by Chen Li and Zhao, and they finally were able to show non-existence uh, for still for bounded solutions without any restriction on P and actually even for a larger class of uh, nonlinearities. Okay, so now the question is about possibly unbounded solutions. Let me stress that for applications it's not so so crucial for applications because for applications it seems that we are stuck with subalt exponent anyway because in the classical rescaling method we need to combine both whole space and half space. So I would say that these studies are more for uh, mathematical reasons, or let's say it's anyway mathematical, but for just for uh, the purpose of uh, understanding the, the, um, the structure of the, of the problem in, in depth, right. So uh, our uh, result was like this. It's a, a result that we obtained in uh, collaboration with Louis Dupeigne and Boyan Sirakov this year. And we uh, were able to, uh, to improve the um, Chen Li Zhao result in the following way. So take any P, and uh, consider solutions which are not bounded, but only bounded on finite, finite strips. So a finite strip is, uh, of course, uh, the part of the half space, which is at finite distance from the boundary, let's say R. So if for each strip, the solution is bounded, um, then this solution cannot exist. There, cannot be, there can be no positive solution which stay bounded at finite distance of the boundary. And, uh, an, uh, a parallel statement is uh, the following. There can, there can never exist positive classical solutions which are increasing in the normal direction. And in fact, there is uh, the second statement is slightly more general because one can show by moving planes that any bounded solution on finite strips has to be monotone in the normal direction. This is a moving plane, from a classical moving plane argument, which basically the denser argument. So, in fact, second uh, statement is uh, contained the first one, although it's not obvious at first sight. And you can even um, embed all these solutions in a larger class, which is a class of stable solutions. I will not give the detailed definition, but probably most of you know it. And um, so we don't know at this stage uh, if uh, we don't have a non-existent statement for stable solutions in half space for OP. This is not known. Uh, but on the other hand, the theorem one remains true for any convex nonlinearity, which is zero at the origin and positive uh, elsewhere. And um, so this is in fact much more general than the uh, gidas prague or the lane equation. It's really something about convexity. So the remaining open question is, okay, now it seems very unlikely that there could exist any positive classical solution of the, in the half space, if such a solution should exist, it would have to blow up at bounded distance from the boundary, which seems a little unlikely. Of course, at space infinity in the tangential direction and, and at finite distance xn. So we don't know if at yet if this is possible or not. Okay, so I would like to give a sketch of the proof of this uh, new theorem one. Um, in fact, we the basic strategy is to use the, 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 the idea of Chen Li Zhao uh, to show that the, the idea was to show that uh, U is convex in the normal direction. So if U is convex in the normal direction, this not, it's not difficult to, to get a contradiction because you have some basic local L1 estimates, which are easy. And uh, so if solution is convex, it has to, in a sense, become large, um, large uh, everywhere in some sense, and you will then contradict some easy L1 estimates. So the main task is to show convexity of the solution. So the first step is to just use the moving planes in the usual way. It tells you if you take a solution which is bound on finite strips, it has to be, uh, it has to be positive uh, derivative in the xn direction. Then the next step is to use the key, uh, key auxiliary function, which uh, the, the idea of this uh, function is, comes also from Chen Li Zhao. So it's a very nice quantity. It's a real 
reminiscent of uh, some actuary functions that you use when you study dynamical systems or second order ODEs, these kind of uh, things, except that now it's in uh, the PDE context. So it's U double prime, prime means uh, normal derivative or derivative in the normal direction, uh, do U double prime divided by one plus X and U prime. So this function has uh, a very nice uh, equation. Uh, in fact, we don't write the equation in the same way as uh, Chen Li Zhao, and this is where we are adding, starting to add new ingredients. So uh, you consider this weighted uh, divergence, divergence form operator. The weight is, uh, you have to compute, there is some computation behind. Uh, so the weight is like this, it's a positive weight. And it turns out that this uh, um, quantity Xi uh, satisfies an equation actually, not just an inequality, but an equation, and you can throw away uh, the additional term, which is, um, which, he, which contains uh, F double prime. And since F is convex, so this gives you an inequality. So the inequality is like L Xi is bigger than essentially Xi square. And also Xi is zero on the boundary because Xi is um, U double prime, Xi and Xi, uh, Xn, Xn. And so if you just look at the equation, Potential derivatives are zero on the boundary, so uh, the, the, um, we, take, we take f of u here, so it's zero, so this is zero on the boundary. So now the question is, with this strange operator, with this weight and this um, inequality, can, you, can we show that xi is necessarily um, non-negative? So if we can show that, we, this will mean that u is convex in the xn direction, and then we get the contradiction that we, what we want. Okay, so um, this is uh, not completely standard because of the weight. Okay, this weight, uh, this weight of the operator. Of course, this kind of inequality is pretty well studied, but it not as it seems with general weights. So the next step is to this lemma, which really plays uh, an essential role in our proof. So it's more general. You take any weight of the operator of this kind with. Uh, Okay, locally bounded weight, uh, positive almost everywhere. And the key assumption is this uh, sub-Gaussian growth uh, for, for, for uh, averages, let's say, for okay, integral of the weight on the ball. BR plus is just the half ball of radius R. So you assume that it doesn't grow, it grows slower than uh, Gaussian in this sense. Okay, and then if you take any weak solution of this inequality, actually, you don't need square, it can be any power q bigger than one. And you can allow the negative part of xi instead of uh, xi itself. So, and if it's true, then the solution, if it's a satisfying solution has to be uh, non-negative everywhere, almost everywhere. Okay, so how we prove this lemma? Uh, okay, first of all, the, yeah, the Gaussian assumption is optimal. This, is, was, this was a nice surprise when we started to study this kind of uh, weighted operators, because there are simple counterexamples in, even in 1D, uh, take just e to the xn to some power bigger than two, and a minus xn is uh, a trivial solution of that. So it's really uh, an optimal uh, assumption here. Uh, so I don't give details, but we prove this by a kind of Moser type iteration. We test with power of xi minus uh, to, the, to, the, to the m times a suitably scale cutoff and the scaling parameter of the cutoff is very important to have, uh, for it to have a, a, a precise relationship with the power m. m has to be some small multiple of r square. You have to be careful about uh, the relation between the cutoff and, uh, and the powers. So it's a kind of Morse type iteration. And then when you send m to infinity, you get um, an L infinity bound, which tells you that uh, the negative part has, uh, the negative part has zero L infinity bound. That's, that's the way we, we prove it. Okay, so this is the lemma. So now we have the lemma. Uh, we uh, have a third ingredient, which is stability estimates. So as we know, uh, okay, we want to show Xi non-negative and to apply the previous lemma to Xi. Uh, the, so the weight, uh, capital A now is uh, the weight uh, depends on solution. It's this, uh, one plus Xn times Uxn square. This is the weight in our case. Uh, uh, okay, so that we, we want to apply lemma one, but we need to estimate the weight because you, you see the, there's a crucial 
uh, as really non-technical because we there are counter examples otherwise. So we, we need this to satisfy the sub Gaussian estimate for uh, the integral of the weight on half balls. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, recall that E to solution is increasing in the x and direction, it is stable. This is a very standard, uh, 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 let's say, spectral uh, property. Okay, and now we need estimate for stable solutions because we want to estimate the weight and uh, we, uh, luckily, we can rely on more or less known estimates for stable solutions. Uh, for instance, if you take any C2 uh, non-negative stable solution of uh, the Leyden equation in the unit ball, then on the half ball, you can control the gra uh, gradient square, the Dirichlet uh, energy, universally on the half ball. And you can also do similar things uh, on half balls uh, if you have zero boundary conditions. Okay, so this is uh, due to the stability of the solution. You can test with uh, essentially U or, uh, okay, and you can use by, uh, various uh, uh, variational identities to, to get this. So uh, this tells you that the weight uh, satisfies, by far satisfies the condition because we need sub Gaussian. Actually, we even have polynomial bound, polynomial upper bound for the weight uh, because now it's uh, obvious because on each unit ball or half unit ball, gradual square um, has bounded uh, integral. So when you just cover uh, a strip of uh, size R by, uh, a number, a finite number of balls, which of unit balls, which is of uh, this number is of the order r to the n, and you have also one plus x n square in the here, so you get r to the n plus two. You need also half balls near the boundary. I don't, I skip some details, and then we can apply uh, the lemma, lemma one, um, and um, this gives you the the conclusion because uh, if you go back to lemma one. It tells you that uh, xi is negative, which means u is convex in the x n direction, and this is not possible. Okay, and now if you want to prove the uh, what I said in the remark, I, I, I mentioned that um, uh, it's true for any convex C2 function which is zero on the boundary, or which are zero at zero, sorry, a positive elsewhere. Uh, this is essentially optimal. And um, so how you do, it, do, do this, uh, you cannot so easily uh, have a property like lemma two for, uh, lemma two is for the line M then. Uh, so for general F, uh, it turns out that uh, a similar result was obtained in a very um, deep paper, recent and deep paper of uh, Cabré, Figali, Ross, Otton, and, and Serra. Uh, okay, it will appear in Acta Mathematica. Uh, next this year and uh, it gives this kind of bounds for stable solutions for very general f so we can rely on this if we want to show theorem uh, one for uh, general f okay so this was my first uh, topic um, now i move to second topic uh, uh, which is in fact closely related because it is the evolution version of the Lane and equation, so it's the non nonlinear heat equation, semi linear heat equation. So uh, let me just state uh, immediately uh, the fantastic result that Pavel Quitner obtained a few months ago, which uh, gives a kind of a final point to more than 20 years uh, of uh, studies on this problem. In my opinion, it's a very, very uh, fundamental result. So he proved that uh, for the superlinear heat equation, there is no positive classical solution uh, on uh, globally defined in time and in space, so entire solution, provided P is sub F subcritical. And of course, this is optimal because uh, for critical or supercritical, you have steady states. So these problems remain long open. Uh, and uh, let me mention some history. And now we go to applications because this theorem has also uh, uh, extremely powerful applications. So the first result, maybe if we want to, to go back uh, very far back, maybe the first result was Fujita with uh, Fujita's result. Actually, Fujita result is for global solutions on positive times. So of course, there, this is much less uh, rigid and there can be many solutions and the optimal 
limitation for such global solution is just the Fujita exponent, which is n plus two over n, which is much smaller than the Sobolev exponent, of course. So this is kind of uh, old ancestor of uh, the Quitner's UVL theorem. Now, uh, Marie-Françoise made a very beautiful contribution in her um, paper of um, 1998, where uh, she was able to prove uh, the same conclusion in a, though in a, in a smaller range, uh, so the upper range, the, the upper bound at the time was n, n plus two over n minus one square and remained unclear for a long time whether or not this uh, exponent uh, was technical. And <laughs> sorry, uh, Marie-Francoise, unfortunately it is technical as it seems now. Um, then the radial case uh, up to the uh, optimal exponent was settled by in two papers by Polacek and Quitner for bounded solutions and by Polacek, Quitner and myself uh, one year later for uh, general solutions, but in the radial case. And recently, uh, Quitner made an improvement uh, which looks innocent, just n equal two, uh, which is optimal uh, in a sense for, for without any radial assumption. But uh, his argument is uh, the first step of uh, the now complete. Uh, result here, and I will try to explain. Uh, okay, let me give some uh, side comments. So now you have the half space, which is very important for applications, as uh, we already saw. And um, we, in fact, we were able to settle the the half space case, at least for bounded solutions, earlier than the whole space case, because in, in the same paper with. Uh, uh, Peter Polacic and Pavel Quigner, we show non-existence of bounded solutions of this equation in R times Rn plus. And um, now as a consequence of the new theorem of Pavel, this is actually true without boundedness assumption for P less than Ps, but in fact, boundedness is not required for applications. As, uh, unboundedness, I mean, boundedness is enough for applications as you know, because of the scaling method. Uh, in fact, um, this uh, condition is not optimal because it can be proved, uh, I don't go to details, in a sli slightly larger range, uh, at least for bounded solutions, and optimality is unknown, similarly as for the gidas prague elliptic uh, result in the house space, so maybe there is still something to do if you want to know what is the uh, optimal bound. Okay. Uh, there is also a very nice related Liouville type theorem for ancient solutions, and this is due to Frank Merle and Hatem Zag. And it's, um, it has some connections with our problem here, but I don't have time to discuss this. So now I'd like to sketch, uh, it's a very hard proof. Uh, Quitner's proof is really a masterpiece. It's a long proof, like 15 page with uh, lots of hard estimates. And I, I would like to explain the main ideas. So uh, the first idea is to go to self -simil uh, similarity variables following Giga Cohn. Uh, and, but not just the standard GigaCon way, you have to allow uh, flexibility in the rescaling time. Okay, so you actually you rescale um, around any center A, so the center is here, and uh, around any final time K. Since you have, a, uh, you start from an entire solution, you want to show the riddle by contradiction, you have this flexibility, you can take any A, any K. So as you know, this introduces two new terms, the red terms here, a drift term, a bounded drift, uh, like a Kronstein Ullenbeck time, uh, type equation, and the linear absorption term. Okay, now it's well known from GigaCon that you have a good energy structure, and the associated energy is this modified energy here with a crucial Gaussian weight uh, here, rho, okay? Okay, now uh, this is the basic idea, uh, which was already used um, for previous proofs, but now comes the real hard part, and this I can not go to details. Uh, now the, the game is to bootstrap the, some energy bounds um, around suitably chosen centers with chosen, suitably chosen powers here. And uh, so you start from some trivial bounds for gamma large enough because they come from, you can assume solution to be bounded because if you don't have any bounded solution, we know by doubling and rescaling arguments that there are no solutions at all. So you can always assume bounded solutions. So if solution, solutions are bounded, it's not difficult to show gradient is bounded. So, okay, you have easy bounds for the energy. If you don't want 
large gamma, uh, small gamma. But large gamma is not very useful. So the game is to end up with small enough gamma and you have small enough gamma, then you can use a rescaling argument. So the trick is to bootstrap on gamma and this requires a lot of technique, uh, bootstrap procedures, uh, vitally covering type arguments, measure arguments and uh, some beautiful lemmas, um, at least, I don't know, six, seven pages. I, I, um, I check everything in detail, it's really fantastic, but I cannot explain it here. Okay, now, uh, when, you, when you have a good enough energy bound with gamma uh, small enough, let's say, close enough to zero, let's say, then you can, you have enough, um, let's say, control on the time variations, because you, you control the energy, to uh, show that this WK, so this real rescale sequence here, uh, as k goes to infinity, would converge to a stationary solution, and this would contradict Gidas prep. Okay, that's that's the way the proof goes. Uh, now you have to go to the, the the preprint is on the archive. If you want to see it, you can uh, you can check everything. Okay, uh, now uh, applications. So these applications are uh, have been known for um, now uh, for a long time. They come from our uh, work with uh, Peter and Pavel in a couple of papers of 2007, where we started to use uh, doubling uh, ideas, doubling lemma combined with the rescaling technique and uh, combined with Liouville theorem. So now if you have uh, theorem two, is just a Liouville theorem, which I, I, okay, this Liouville theorem, okay. So if you combine all these, you have a lot of, you have a bunch of applications where, uh, which gives you uh, almost every estimate you would like to know on the, for non-negative solution of this equation in the cervical range. So now this is completely established thanks to the new Liouville theorem. So any solution satisfies uh, initial and final uh, blow rate estimates either in smooth domain or in the whole space. Uh, the novelty here is that you can use, you can include non-convex domains, whereas the, the gigacone uh, techniques require the convexity of the domain. Uh, so you have this kind of uh, blow up uh, estimate, uh, which are optimal, uh, final and initial, and also with uh, universal constants. In fact, Marie-Françoise uh, gave the first proof, the first estimate of this kind uh, in the whole space uh, in her 98 paper uh, with, with the help of her Liouville or equivalent to Liouville estimates uh, for in this restricted range uh, at the time. Uh, P less than n plus two and n minus one square. Okay, now you can also get a decay estimates for global solutions by the same kind of ideas. Any global solution has to decay like this and with a universal constant. You have also universal bounds away for t equals zero for global solution. And you have also universal estimate for solutions which are local both in space and time, uh, this time involving the distance to the boundary of the domain. And all these estimates involve universal constants. So that's, uh, as you can see, the, this Liouville theorem is very, uh, very powerful. Uh, now, uh, okay, now, now it's time to go to the third uh, topic. Um, okay, the diffusive hamilton jacobi equation. So I'm very lucky because Alessio Porretta uh, gave a very nice and complete uh, talk yesterday on, the, on this equation. So I will just focus on some more uh, specific points that he didn't have time to, to explain and uh, which are related to um, some Liouville type uh, theorems. Okay, so we consider the super quadratic or supernatural, now I, I learned this new <laughs> terminology, supernatural uh, growth, okay. Natural growth I knew, but supernatural growth, it is a, of course, funny, funny way to, describe it. Uh, so some key features which are, uh, were uh, explained by Alessio yesterday, uh, let me just mention three of them. So the first key feature of this problem is that uh, uh, you have a finite time blow up uh, in the sense of gradient blow up, GBU, so U, does, U stays bounded but the gradient goes to infinity. Uh, you have a unique continuation as a global viscosity solution which may possibly lose classic, uh, in the classical sense, it may lose boundary conditions. Also, as Alessio recalled yesterday, uh, it's uh, sometimes very useful to uh, remind that the solution can be uh, obtained as increasing limit of classical solutions of truncated problems. 
this is a way to avoid uh, viscosity theory for when those who don't want to use it, or sometimes it can also uh, technically very, very be useful to derive uh, various estimates. And a, a, a third key feature of this problem is that singularities appear only on the boundary or on some part of the boundary. Okay, so now I would like to, of, of course, that the related elliptic problem, which I will discuss uh, in this connection, is uh, uh, for, for the Liouville property, is the half space problem. Uh, but uh, without time derivatives, really elliptic. I will explain why uh, elliptic is enough enough for what we want to do. Of course, we could also ask about the parabolic version of this, and there are some. It can be studied. Uh, it's not completely understood, and probably there are some interesting things to do on it. But today, uh, the elliptic uh, version is uh, is good enough. Okay, so these are the um, two connected problems. So what about the whole space case for the elliptic equation, the elliptic uh, Hamilton-Jacobi, okay, Hamilton-Jacobi, um, Kaslan-Warner maybe. Uh, so it was a result, um, famous result of Pierre Louis Lyons in uh, 1985. He proved that any classical solution for any power P actually greater than one, it's enough. Any classical solution in the whole space has to be constant, but only constant solutions, okay? So uh, what about the Hull space? So Hull space, uh, I remind you, this is this, okay? This problem. So this is the um, result that we obtained uh, last year uh, in a joint talk with uh, Roberta Filippucci and Patrizia Pucci, and uh, it just appeared uh, a few months ago. And uh, we show the following. Um, now P is bigger than two, you take any, Okay, classical solution of um, the equation, uh, elliptic, this elliptic equation in the whole space, on the whole space with uh, boundary, zero boundary conditions, then V is one dimensional. It depends only on the variable Xn. Okay, Xn. Uh, so it's a classification Liouville type theorem. It's not non existence, it's classification because solutions do exist. In fact, if you, uh, it means that they solve the ODE, though the ODE is just minus V double prime equals V prime P uh, for S positive with zero initial value. And it's of course a first year exercise to compute the solution because you can reduce the order to one. And then you have zero and you have this family of solutions. And um, there is a maximal solution which is just held or continuous but not uh, Lipschitz. And, and you can, draw the solutions and so the singular one is on top of all the others and they are ordered so it's a foliation of solution and it's very useful for many applications to to see this uh, let me mention that uh, there is a joint a previous result uh, very related by alessio Poretta and, and laurent veron they showed that this theorem is uh, of course it's older it's not 2006 they were able to show uh, one dimensionality uh, in the range uh, p uh, less than two or equal to two, okay? The proof is uh, rather different and the structure of solution is quite different. You don't have this picture anymore because now solutions, uh, okay, they have another, another shape. Uh, I don't have time to go to details. They need, uh, okay, uh, it's like this. Uh, okay, so how we prove this? It's not a very difficult proof and uh, it has lots of applications which I try to discuss and in fact, Going from theorem three to the applications is a lot more difficult to, than to establish um, theorem three itself. But let me anyway give the um, sketch of the proof. So, okay, we do translation in the tangential direction. This is uh, quite natural because we want to show that solution depends only on uh, the, okay, the y variable, y is x n now, right? X tilde is uh, are the other tangential variables. So you do, we do, tangential uh, translations and we want to show that uh, they are identically zero. So by contradiction, assume that one of these translation is uh, uh, non-zero, let's say as for instance, uh, positive supremum. So the first step is to use the Pierre Williams uh, local Bernstein estimate, which in this case will give you a bound like this, uh, which is uh, okay, singular at finite distance from the boundary, but uh, which decays, which uh, damps everything when you go far away from the boundary. 
So uh, with this, you can immediately see that if Z has a supremum, the positive supremum has to be localized actually in the finite strip. It cannot occur at infinity in the normal direction. It has to stay at finite distance of the boundary. Maybe not at finite point in the first step, but at, at, in the finite strip. But now if you do translations, uh, again, you again do translations part to the boundary and use some compactness procedure, you can show that the supremum actually has to occur at a finite point. Okay, you have to work a little bit, but uh, it's, it's a not very difficult compactness argument. And uh, once you have the supremum localized finite point, so the new function, not Z, but let's say Z infinity after the compactness procedure, satisfies a linear equation with a drift, just a linearized equation from our uh, hamilton jacobi equation, but the drift is locally bounded because of the, uh, of the um, uh, Bernstein estimate. And then you can use just locally the strong maximum principle to get a contradiction. So, so you see the, the proof is uh, like this. So now I would like to discuss the applications of this Liouville uh, uh, theorem. So let me show the theorem again. Um, okay, just uh, one dimensionality, okay. Uh, so the applications, first applications about the bro a gradient blower profile. So um, I'm lucky because uh, Alessio explained these things yesterday already, so I don't have to explain anything again. So if you take the, let's say the first blow up time of the solution, uh, the, of the, let's say the first time where the solution ceases to be classical, so be C1. Um, so there is the, um, this, let's denote capital T this time. Uh, if you take any gradient blow up point A, uh, so it's, it has to be a boundary point, we know it. Uh, and so you want to understand the local profile near that point. So the final profile is like this. Uh, so A is the point, new A is the inner unit normal vector at that point. And so you go in the normal direction. And uh, so in particular, uh, the gradient uh, behaves like this. It's a sharp constant, this sharp constant. Uh, explicitly compute, times distance to the boundary uh, to the power, uh, the scaling power minus one over P minus one. So on the, on the plot here, on the, on the picture, this, um, uh, this uh, bold uh, uh, line or curve uh, corresponds to uh, the normal profile. Okay, now you, you can ask what about the tangential profile? Because we know that sometimes uh, we can prove single point blow up on the boundary. So let's say here we have Okay, this simplified setting, we have only 2D and only uh, and, and a flat boundary. But this is the kind of situations where we, we can prove single point blow up, for instance. And there are also more recent results by uh, Carlos Esteve who proved uh, single point blow up in much more general geometries, and not necessarily uh, disks or, 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 or uh, halves half uh, of flat boundaries. Anyway, uh, so now uh, if it's a single point, the, the gradient has to become smooth. When you move away from this point, not in the normal, but in the tangential direction, and you would like to understand how fast uh, it goes, uh, uh, it, it becomes smooth. So uh, as a first consequence of the, our uh, Liouville theorem, we can show that in any geometry, any domain, any case, any gradient blow point, uh, the, the normal derivative has to um, become, it has to be more singular or the smooth, the, the, let's say the way it is uh, getting smooth in the tangential direction is more singular than in the normal direction. That is that limit. So now you take limits when X moves to A along the boundary. So here it's flat, it's easy, it's just along the X axis. In general, it's just moving along the, the manifold with, uh, the boundary manifold, okay. Uh, and so the, this uh, smoothing is, uh, uh, this limit is infinity, whereas here it is, uh, it is finite, okay. Okay, this is, we have to compare these two expressions. This is in the tangential direction, normal direction, sorry, and this is in the tangential direction, okay. Now, in some cases, but there are much, um, much more uh, particular situations, uh, we can show that uh, we can compute the exact profile Actually, uh, sometimes it's two over p minus two. Uh, we don't have a, a complete theory of this. This we did with Alessio Poeta. Okay, uh, but this is quite general, although it doesn't tell you what, what should be the actual exp exponent. Okay, other applications, maybe, um, I don't know how many 
minutes I have, 10 minutes maybe, five, 10? I, I, 10, I think. Is it okay? uh, I think you have like more than 10, like uh, 10, from 10 to 15 minutes. That's okay, okay, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm fine. So I can explain this too. Uh, so another application of this um, Liouville type theorem uh, is um, uh, something which is, uh, okay, my previous two results were about the final time, the, let's say the, the first grain blow up time. So it's not really final in the sense of solution, we know solution can be continued uh, after that. But uh, the first time where solution becomes uh, non-classical uh, and at that time we have uh, this information on the profile. So it's at a fixed time slice uh, and now it's only a space, uh, a spatial, uh, special information. Now, if you want to understand the space-time behavior, so it's a different uh, game. Uh, it's much more complicated. And um, what we can show, so I don't give a, a formal, uh, a, a precise, uh, rigorous uh, uh, statement, but uh, what we can show is that uh, asymptotically, the, um, the mechanism, which is uh, the leading mechanism in the equation, is what you get by just neglecting the red terms and just uh, equating the terms in boxes here. In other words, minus u, nu, nu behaves like u, nu to the p. Nu is a normal derivative, and uh, of course, you, uh, you, one should remind that uh, the normal derivative, the normal vector field can be extended to some, to some uh, neighborhood of the, of the boundary. So in the neighborhood of the boundary, you can always, um, well defined, defined uh, the, the normal vector is well defined just by projection and regularity of the domain. Okay, so this makes sense in the um, in some space-time region here. So in the space and region, in other words, in the space-time region where gradu is very big, in the sense to, which can, can be made precise, uh, these two terms are of the same order. So there is uh, an analogy with um, a famous result of uh, Mayer and Zach for the a seminar heat equation, uh, the subcritical case, where they uh, were able to show that in the, in the region where u is very big, of course, for this equation, u blows up, Why for our equation, grad u blows up. So the analog is here, u very big. So in the, let's say the singular regime, uh, uh, the dominant mechanism is ut uh, behaving like u the p. So in other words, uh, the diffusion uh, becomes asymptotically uh, negligible. And um, this theorem by Mel and Zach was proved by means of a Liouville type theorem for ancient solutions, which I briefly mentioned uh, before, uh, that they established in the same paper, a very deep uh, result. And um, so we also established this behavior by means of a Liouville theorem. Our is much more elementary, uh, but the, the, then the work to go from the Liouville to the, um, this kind of estimate is quite technical. Uh, as also in the boundary, we are near the boundary. You, you have to deal with a lot of boundary estimates. It's not, not so easy. And there is, okay, now if you want to compare the two results, um, the philosophy is that there is, okay, two terms in the equation which are uh, of leading order. And uh, they, uh, they uh, suggest an ODE, the correspond to an ODE uh, mechanism. And the ODE, the ODE variable is the time variable in the case of the seminar heat equation. And the ODE variable is the normal, uh, the normal uh, direction, normal space direction in the case of the Hamilton Jacobi. So it's quite different, but there is an analogy. And um, okay, uh, just a small remark, these red terms, which I neglect here, cannot, uh, doesn't, the fact that we can neglect them is just a first order approximation. It does not trivialize at all the equation because it just tells you something. But if you want to compute real exponents, you need to do, uh, to, to, to estimate them. Although they are lower order, they cannot be ignored if you really want to compute things like a tangential profile exponents. So uh, for instance, in my previous slide, when uh, in this result that we got with Alessio, uh, we, we compute the two or p minus two, all the difficulty was exactly to estimate the contribution of these kind of terms, not directly, but indirectly. So if you just uh, equate, if you just say, um, just use this, you only get information in the normal uh, direction, but not in the tangential direction. 
Okay, uh, a, a last application of this uh, Liouville theorem is about the, um, the viscosity solution, which do not lose boundary conditions. So for those who uh, uh, remember uh, Alessio Poretta's talk of yesterday, you have two kinds of, uh, uh, so after blow up, you have a global uh, viscosity solution. It can lose or it may or may not lose boundary conditions. And you have two types. Uh, according to whether they lose or don't lose boundary conditions. And uh, eventually they are all recovering boundary conditions for sufficiently large time and then forever. But uh, in the transitory uh, time um, range, uh, there can be loss or, no, or, or sometimes no loss. Okay, so we know from our paper from, with Alessio, uh, we know uh, that such uh, solutions without loss of boundary conditions always exist by a kind of shooting argument. And what we were able to show with, uh, by, in this paper with um, uh, Roberta Filippucci and Patrizia Pucci uh, by using this Liouville theorem is that such solutions are really exceptional in any dimension, in any situation, actually, in any domain. Uh, we could do it in one dimension with uh, Alessio because it's easier, but um, in higher dimension, you really need this uh, Liouville theorem to characterize the, ten, the normal profile. So once you know the normal profile which, uh, with um, sharp constant, so this is the profile which is here, okay? Uh, it's enough to show that you cannot have, uh, uh, you cannot have, let's say, you, for instance, you cannot have two ordered um, solutions like this. This kind of solution without lots of boundary conditions, they cannot be ordered. So it means that such solutions are completely unstable, both from above and from below, and they are really thresholds between global classical and green globe solutions. Okay, so probably that's all for this um, uh, problem. So now I'd look to the fourth problem. So it's a kind of mixture between the uh, previous two, uh, the Lane Emden and the uh, Hamilton Jacobi. As you see, it's a product. Okay, so maybe it's a little more, uh, let's say uh, purely aesthetic because it's not clear if this uh, equation has, um, okay, is related to something, something else or to some other physical application or whatever. Uh, but anyway, it's very interesting to understand this kind of equation when you already know a lot on the uh, pure um, lane Emden case and the pure Hamilton Jacobi, then it's natural to ask what happens if you mix the two of them so, um, okay, this is our theorem. Again, it's an, another paper with uh, Roberta and Patricia. Uh, it appeared in the special volume dedicated to Marie-Françoise and Laurent, so we are very happy to, uh, um, uh, to report. I'm very happy to report on this here. Uh, so it says that if, so, we, uh, okay, we are interested in the superquadratic case because the subquadratic case I, uh, I was studied before I will go back to this. So uh, when Q is bigger than two and P is any, any P positive, then uh, if you consider bounded classical solutions, non-negative bounded classical solutions of this, they have to be necessarily constant. Okay, there are no non-constant bounded solutions. Okay, so the case Q less than two was studied in detail by, um, okay, in two papers, I would say, um, recently by, by Marie-Françoise Laurent and Marta, uh, Garcia Udobro, a very nice paper which appeared in the Duke Journal last year. And there are an early, earlier study by, maybe more, but at least this study by uh, this paper. And, uh, okay, sorry for type typo here. Jorge Garcia Millian, Bogos Perez, Alejandro Coas. So there are various regions of non existence, non -existence and existence in the, when Q is less than two, it's actually uh, quite complicated that I, I cannot give details here, but Marta uh, explained to us uh, lots of things in her talk. Uh, but in the super critical, super critical, super quadratic case, in a sense, it is, uh, situation is simpler because uh, there are no non-constant bounded solutions. Okay, uh, still the uh, result is uh, non-trivial because if you look now at super solutions, they are always a super solution whenever uh, this condition is satisfied. It means that Q can be big or small or whatever. There is a balance between P and Q, actually, uh, at least in 
starting from 3, 3Ds. So for super solutions, uh, there are a bunch of uh, solutions, but for solutions as usually is the case, it's more, much more rigid and in particular, there is no bounded, uh, non-constant non bounded solutions. So uh, the open question for Q bigger than two is, can one relax the assumption that U is bounded? This we don't know how to do it. It seems a difficult problem. Now, uh, the remaining couple of minutes that I hope I have, I'm going to um, just give a, uh, some sketch of the proof of theorem, theorem four. So the basic tool is, uh, so it's quite different from the previous proofs. Uh, you, so you see just uh, some small uh, side comment. Uh, you will uh, Non-nearly will type theorems are a fascinating uh, topic. There are now lots of them in many contexts. Um, some people call, call them rigidity theorem, uh, especially people working in dispersive uh, uh, evolution equations are also very uh, powerful tools. And uh, it's fascinating because it's um, a very kind of unity in the, in the topic. It's, uh, the, the, the philosophy is always the same, but there are many different types of proofs of uh, ingredients depending on the equation. There are many different tools. There is not a unique recipe for uh, obtaining a Liouville theorem at this uh, at this moment, maybe in the future, we don't know, but uh, it's really worth uh, thinking about that. How, how come that such a, um, because the statement is always more or less the same, uh, take a solution on the whole space on a large set, um, very, it, can, it has to be constant or it has to be uh, one dimensional, it has, to, it has to have some very uh, strong rigidity. But the proof is almost uh, each time a different uh, game. So in our case, the basic tool is using the monotone decreasing or increasing property for uh, spherical averages of superharmonic or su subharmonic functions. Okay, so this of course is a very well-known uh, fact, but how to, but we want to use both actually. We want to combine superharmonicity and subharmonicity to force a solution to be constant. So what is superharmonic is very clear. U is superharmonic of course, because uh, it satisfies this equation. And actually you can more precisely consider U minus its uh, infimum because we are talking about global uh, bounded, sol uh, bounded solution on the whole space, right? So bounded solution, so it takes U minus infimum of U, it's, it's a non-negative superharmonic function. So what will be the good subharmonic quantity? So uh, we want to show that this quantity, just the same, but to a sufficiently large power M, very big power will be subharmonic. So this looks strange at first sight. Uh, you have, of course, you have comp you just compute the Laplacian of this, so it's a very natural computation. You you, you have several terms. I'm not doing, so reproducing the computation here. You can do it, and uh, you, and you have several terms which possibly have different sign. But if you want if you want the good sign to make it subharmonic for large M it boils down to showing that this product is bounded. This is very strange. Uh, of course, the, the scaling of the problem is uh, hidden there. You see that uh, being subquadratic or superquadratic makes a lot of difference because you have P minus two, which comes out here. And it turns out that we, we can show precisely this boundedness provided U is bounded. If U is bounded, we can show that this is also bounded. And the proof is by, uh, not so easy local Bernstein argument. Uh, of course, in the talk of Marta uh, two days ago, uh, you saw um, several, uh, several ways to apply the local Bernstein technique. It can be very involved. Uh, this one is kind of involved, but maybe not, not extremely complicated either. And uh, so if U is bounded, we can show this is bounded. And if this is bounded, then when you compute the Laplacian of this W, you can compare the different contributions to make it um, the correct sign, to make the W subharmonic. This is very strange, but it works. So, uh, okay, uh, and um, so why M has to be large? Because actually the size of M depends on the size of U. If you have a bound on U, or bound on U, which is very big, you need to take a very big M. This is very strange, this interplay between the power of the auxiliary function and the size of the solution. I didn't see this before, but okay, why not? Now, if you combine uh, these opposite uh, monotonicity properties of spherical averages that you obtain from, let's say, point uh, 
B and point C, let's the fact that V is superharmonic and W is subharmonic. So <coughs> you have a monotonicity of spherical radius going in two opposite direction. And at the end, uh, the only way this can be true uh, is by having you a constant. And that's so that's the way the proof goes. And I'm going to stop here and uh, I would like to congratulate Marie-Françoise and Laurent again for the very inspiring and, and very uh, uh, very uh, fr friendly uh, interaction that we had in the past, let's say, 20 years. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much for the nice Beautiful talk. lecture. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so uh, are there any questions or remarks for the speaker? Yes. Question, not uh, remarks. The, the result of Kitner is impressive. <laughs> sure. did, you, did you have a chance to, to look at the, the preprint? No, no, it's the first time we didn't know. Oh, you didn't know? Okay, he didn't send it to you. Okay. No, 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 we, we, we didn't. He's too shy. He's too shy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very, it, it, very nice. Very, very, very nice. Very nice. I really checked. I was so excited by I really checked every line, every, every, every computation. It's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. That's true. That's so and nice. it, it has appeared? Uh, it's an archive. archive. Not yet. Not yet, but uh, you can find a preprint on archive. It's from March. No, it's very important, yes. Mm, yeah. And also your results about the fourth problem are very